I now invite Valerie Pearsall to come forward to light the chalice and lead us in our affirmation of covenant, which is in your order of service. Let there be light, the light of joy, the light of happiness, and the light of contentment. May it illuminate our paths and fill our lives with peace. And let there be dark, for it is from our dark places that we are brought forward, tried and tested, and impelled toward growth. It is in these places that we realize compassion and learn to love. And there was day and there was night, and there was joy and there was sorrow, and it was good. Now please join me in reading the Affirmation of Covenant printed in your order of service, saying, Love is the doctrine of this church, the quest for truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship, to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with the divine, thus do we covenant with each other. The date was September 14th, 1874. The place was New Orleans on Canal Street. The city's Metropolitan Brigade had been deployed to protect the state's Republican governor, who was sheltering in the St. Louis Hotel, commandeered that summer to serve as the state capital. Almost 10 years before, Robert E. Lee had made a noble symbolic gesture to receive communion side by side with a black man. Now, his wartime second-in-command, James Longstreet, found himself in command of 500 men, black and white, ready to fight side by side. There he is. <laughs> After the war, Longstreet had settled in New Orleans to begin a career in business. He joined a partnership to form a cotton brokerage and also became president of a newly founded insurance company. And he tried to get in on the post-war railroad boom, but without success. To mark the second anniversary of the war's end, the editor of the New Orleans Times invited him and 17 other prominent ex-Confederate leaders to express their views on the Federal Reconstruction Acts. Longstreet wrote two letters. In the first, he expressed the plain, honest convictions of a soldier, as he put it, that the South had fought and lost, and now it was Southerners' duty to accept the terms of surrender and to obey the law. It was the only way to have a voice and a seat at the political table. It was the path to ending military supervision and restoring civilian rule. In his second letter, he came out as a Republican. He wrote, the war was made on Republican issues and it seems to me fair and just that the settlement should be made accordingly. The sword has decided in favor of the North and what they claimed as principles cease to be principles and are become law. The views that we hold cease to be principles because they are opposed to the law. It is our duty to conform to the requirements of the law. Here was a soldier's appreciation for law. One who has survived the chaos of battle understands that law is for civilians what discipline is in the ranks. His views were not well received. 
Social acquaintances began shunning him and his family in public. His business dried up, and he was denounced in newspaper editorials throughout the South. When he wrote Lee to ask for a word of public support, Lee replied that he avoided all discussion of political questions. Lee kept his political silence to his death three years later. Longstreet was the only senior Confederate officer to join the Republican Party after the war. And in the 1868 election, the year Congress granted the restoration of his rights of citizenship, he supported Grant, his old friend from West Point, husband of his fourth cousin. Grant appointed him surveyor of the port of New Orleans, a plum patronage job with a good income. The state reconstruction government later appointed him adjutant general of the Louisiana State Militia. By 1872, he commanded all militia and police forces across in New Orleans. And on September 14th, 1874, he was in personal command of the New Orleans Military Police, the Metropolitan Brigade. I think. That's what I wanted. <laughs> Longstreet and his brigade advanced down Charter Street toward Canal. His opponents waited for him on Poydras Street. And if you knew New Orleans, Canal Street and Poydras Street converge at the river. His opponents joked that they had barricaded at Poydre Street in the Parisian style. They derailed street, a derailed streetcar blocked St. Charles Avenue, and lumber and barrels closed off Camp Street, improvisations resembling those used in a Paris uprising three years before. A shot was fired, and one of Longstreet's horsemen felt it in his leg. The enemy on Poydras Street began moving toward the river. Longstreet ordered his men down to the foot of Canal Street. They met near what is now Convention Center Boulevard, adjacent to Harris Casino. <laughs> Longstreet had brought artillery, a Gatling gun, two 12-pound 12 12 brass cannons, and four smaller pieces, and his men opened fire with them. A hail of bullets came in reply. Advancing up the levee, the enemy fired from behind cotton bales, freight cars, and buildings. Then came a sound that made Longstreet go pale. His enemies let loose a rebel yell and charged down the levee. Longstreet's men ran. He tried to rally them at the Custom House. A company of white men under his command went over to the enemy. Some of his black soldiers took shelter inside the Custom House. The rest retreated to Jackson Square. All this happened in less than 15 minutes. 31 men were dead and close to 100 wounded. A small contingent of federal troops stationed at the Custom House, had stayed out of the fight. Longstreet, out of ammunition, got no help from them. The next morning, he surrendered the State House and went home. This became known as the Battle of Liberty Place. Am I going the wrong way? Oh, it will, it will. I have faith. <laughs> uh-huh, there they are with their cannons. There we are. 
The enemy Longstreet faced that day were some 5,000 members and followers of the White League who had rallied that morning on Canal Street at St. Charles Avenue where the Henry Clay Monument then stood. And you can see him on a high pedestal just left of center on that drawing. That was the same spot where 13 years before men had rallied to join the Confederate Army. So it had a meaning to, to rally there. They held the Capitol for about two weeks, installing the governor's Democratic opponent in the previous election. Confronted by a federal general with orders not to recognize him as the governor, the Democrat turned the occasion into political theater. Denying that there had been an insurrection, sound familiar? <laughs> He protested this military interference in state affairs and said that he had no desire to resist federal forces and he surrendered the state house to the U.S. Army and pointedly not to his Republican rival. A formal surrender ceremony followed, accompanied by federal fifes and drums. The Army quickly returned the state house to the elected Republican governor who served out the remainder of his term, but you can vividly imagine what that must have been like. <laughs> Later, at the foot of Canal Street, where Longstreet's men took their stand, a monument was built to the White League. It stood there until 1989, when it was taken down, it was said to protect it from damage during some necessary street work. <laughs> when it returned in 1993, despite a city council vote that year declaring it a public nuisance, it was moved to a less prominent location between a flood wall and the Weston Hotel. There it is. Uh, the Western Hotel parking garage, I should say, not the hotel itself. Neatly tucked out of sight behind the Weston and the aquarium, a more historically accurate spot, some said. There you could still read the names of the men who briefly overthrew the state government. This monument was one of four removed for good in 2017. Yeah, that's what I wanted. <laughs> We're Longstreet, okay, good. After the war, Longstreet took a very pragmatic view of Reconstruction. He was no booster for the rights or equality of black people, but he recognized that the war was over, the South had lost, the devastated country needed rebuilding, and the North was offering, this, offering the means to do that. He wrote public letters urging Southerners to accept the North's help and terms. He joined the Republican Party and went on to a career in the federal government as a diplomat and civil servant. And he was vilified for it. Some historians developed the lost cause interpretation of the war and his reputation was tarred for a century. To them, he wasn't Lee's right-hand man. He was somebody Lee kept close to him just to keep an eye on him. The Gettysburg defeat was his fault, and so on. His defeat in the 1874 insurrection shows his pragmatism. He surrendered the State House and went home. It also shows that in his situation, Pragmatism didn't stand a chance. He was caught between two polarized political groups. Can you imagine? One group, in the name of Reconstruction, sought to reorder political and labor relations in the South by enforcing civil rights 
and imposing a system of free labor, so-called. The other sought to preserve a white supremacist social order, which they saw as a moral good and an instrument of God's work to perfect the world, which is one reason why they called their movement redemption. In his book, A Failure of Nerve, Edwin Friedman names three characteristics of an imaginatively gridlocked society. A treadmill of always trying harder, a focus on finding answers rather than reframing questions, and a polarization into false dichotomies. That's what Reconstruction and Redemption represented. An imaginatively gridlocked response to the end of the war. Reconstructionists and Redemptionists tried harder and harder to the point of force and violence to find answers within the limits of their racially and philosophically polarized imaginations. Reconstruction was a political and economic phenomenon that played out in the institutions of the federal government, including the military, as we've seen in the story of that late unpleasantness on Canal Street. The horrors of the war had motivated generals on both sides to choose peace and to find the courage to show each other respect, courtesy, and generosity in making the peace. The politicians were divided as to what Reconstruction should look like, and in shaping the peace, their often flawed efforts and compromises were guided by these same values. That is one reason it took another hundred years to begin to secure civil rights for the formerly enslaved. Redemption was a social and cultural phenomenon played out in the civilian life of the country, north and south, as the people wrestled with how to meet the requirements of what the politicians enacted in law. They struggled to reconcile the implications of civil rights and free labor with other beliefs they held, or Sorry about that. Huh. Been a long time since I lost my place of manuscript. <laughs> they struggled to reconcile the implications of civil rights and free labor with other beliefs they held or to limit the implications to the bounds of their imaginative horizon. Those who struggled hardest, like the men whose names were on the White League Monument, turned to violence. In the intersection of Reconstruction politics and economics with redemption social and moral culture, we can see why creating justice out of that peace has taken so very long and is in fact ongoing. It's not hard to follow how the redemptionists rationalized their violent and bullying means of limiting black political participation, thus maintaining their own social and economic dominance for one reason or another, and quite a variety of arguments were put forward. It was asserted that whites were superior to blacks. Blacks, it was said, were not capable of properly exercising either citizenship or leadership. Some thought they never would be. Others thought that under white influence they could learn. Either way, this understanding of race made it seem to many minds natural that whites and blacks should stand in a relationship of master and servant. The same understanding underlay the European colonization of Africa itself, the so-called scramble for Africa, underway in these same years. Most Northern free labor advocates understood race this way. And in the South, 
legal means was found through convict labor to recreate the kind of master-servant relationship that had prevailed under slavery. All that's easy to wrap your mind around. What's hard is to wrap one's heart around this historical situation. Racial prejudice aside, why was the master-servant relationship worth the blood? As always, the door to the heart's understanding is through a symbol. This painting is called The Burial of La Tenay. It was painted in 1864 by the Richmond painter William Washington. It depicts a real historical event, which I'll tell you about in a minute. First, I want to say a word or two about its symbolism. This painting was displayed at the Confederate Capitol in Richmond with a donation bucket in front of it. It had the power to move people, to contribute money for the Confederate cause. It had the power to do that late in the war when the Confederate cause was every day becoming more desperate. So there's more going on here than just support for the troops or sympathy for the women back home. No doubt such patriotic ardor and patriarchal condescension were in the mix of feelings it evoked, at least for some, but there was also something deeper here that moved its viewers much more profoundly. What is depicted here, formally, is a wartime household. The male householder is missing, or is perhaps represented by the fallen soldier, La Tenay. The mistress of the household, head of its domestic sphere, is at the center. On one side are the daughters and children of the household, and on the other are the slaves. Significantly, one of the children of the household stands near them. Also significantly, the women stand in the light, the slaves in the dark. This is a way of symbolizing the benevolent purpose of servitude. In paintings like this one, classified by art historians as examples of 19th century grand style, historical painting, the figures may be intended to depict actual people, but they are arranged in symbolic groups. Here's another example of the grand style genre, Benjamin West's painting depicting the death of General Wolfe at the Battle of Quebec during the French and Indian War. The uniforms identify the symbolic groups, or in the case of the Indian here, the symbolic lone figure. Wolf is at the center, dying of course. This painting is about Wolf, not the peripheral figures. All eyes are on him, including yours. In the same way, the burial of La Tenay is about the mistress of the household, or rather, it's about what she's doing. Now let me tell you about the real event this painting is meant to depict. In 1862, early in the war, Union General George McClellan led an assault on Richmond, which became known as the Peninsula Campaign. In those early days, the badly outnumbered Confederate armies were winning battles despite higher casualty counts, as if aided by divine intervention. The key to victory in the Peninsula Campaign had been Major General Jeb Stuart's scouting mission, known as the Ride Around McClellan's Army. 29-year-old Captain William Latanay was the only casualty in that mission. The story goes that two families on neighboring plantations near where he fell saw to his proper Christian burial. Latane's brother, John, brought his body to them and left to rejoin his unit. 
The mistress of the house sent for a minister, but the enslaved man she sent on this errand was turned back by union pickets. So her neighbor, mistress of the next door plantation, found a prayer book and did the ceremony. She's the one in the center of this painting. Symbolically, this is one household, but historically it was two. Symbolically, they are tending their own, but historically, they are tending a stranger. The power of this painting for its viewers was its suggestion that the Confederacy was a household, one family serving God as best it could, and that the fallen soldiers were everyone's sons and fathers. That's what tugged at viewers' hearts. And there's one other layer to it. This household, with its arrangements influenced by both the demands of agrarian work and the model of biblical patriarchy, was enshrined in English political and labor law, which America inherited. According to English law, a household was a political jurisdiction. That's why if you wanted to get married, you went to the justice of the peace the official in charge of political jurisdictions. The householder was deemed the master of his household and of everyone in it. He had to be to have the legal authority to keep the peace. And therefore, except for the dead man, everyone in this picture is a servant. Under English labor law, all laborers were servants. And it was legal to restrict the movements of laborers if their work was needed by the community. There was no such thing as free labor. They had quite a time reining in journeymen who having progressed beyond apprenticeship were eager to become master craftsmen in their own right with their own household of journeymen and apprentices to govern. If your labor was needed, the community wouldn't let you go on that journey. And the justice of the peace would enforce the community's right before yours. The legal standing of apprentices, indentured servants, and slaves was similar. To work out the idea of free labor, it was necessary to reimagine this legal framework and this was slowly being done by American courts. The landmark case of Mary Clark, a woman of color, in 1821 laid the groundwork. Mary Clark was a free woman of color, of legal age to regulate her own conduct and therefore her will could not be legally overruled. The Indiana State Supreme Court ruled that while she had voluntarily signed a contract making her an indentured servant for a period of 20 years, she had, by her application to the court, expressed her will to serve no longer. Under traditional English law, her signature on that contract overruled whatever she might want to do now. If her labor was needed and she had agreed to it, her master could restrict her movement and hold her to complete her term of service. But the court held that such enforcement of the contract would be worse than slavery because presumably a slave would accept servitude, but a court-enforced indentured servant would resent it. The court ruled that she should be released from the contract. This was all the more significant because she was not white. The decision was about recognizing her right to exert her will, regardless of her race or gender. And so it was an enduring challenge to the public North and South. I can't see, is it on? Did it change? Back to the painting? Okay. The burial of Latine then expresses a complex commitment 
to the household as vessel of master-servant relationships, then seen as the bedrock of social order. The racial and patriarchal components are here, but also a political and legal heritage that restricted the Southern and Northern imagination. Slavery became convict labor because convicts don't have contractual rights. Industrial employers of free laborers could exact long hours for low pay because of their economic power, allowed them to impose such conditions, and the free labor ideology of the day suggested that if workers didn't like it, they should simply look for another job. You've never heard anything like that today, have you? <laughs> Nobody wrapped their mind around the problem of economic power until the rise of the labor movement, and then, like civil rights and voting rights and social equality and everything else Reconstruction implied, it was a fight, and it still is. We still struggle to find the courage, the respect, the courtesy, and the generosity to push past the horizons of our inheritance. We struggle to find that key virtue for shaping the peace in the image of justice, to shape peace that way. We have to see the image. And oh, how we struggle to find the imagination to see it. Courage, respect, courtesy, and generosity we must have to make and remake the peace. But imagination, imagination is the great virtue we need to keep it. May, we, may it live boldly in each of us. Amen. And I'd like to invite Valerie to come back and extinguish the chalice for us as we say our closing words in unison. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. And keep on imagining a better world.